Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday afternoon Bible study. We're going to get back to our study on John the Baptist this evening. If you'd like to get your Bibles and read along, we're going to begin in Matthew chapter number three. From there, we'll be going to Mark chapter one and then also Luke chapter three and John chapter one. So while you're getting your Bibles and turning to Matthew three, I'll share with you a blessing that God has allowed that I could uh, share how I enjoyed that. And that was the, this last Sunday in church, we had a missionary guest speaker on Sunday morning. We don't very often get to have a real live missionary speaking to us who's been to the foreign field and is getting ready to be deployed across the ocean to a foreign field again. And this particular missionary was quite uh, special in that uh, he's going to a place that he couldn't tell us. And we didn't know his real name. And all of that was for safety and security's sake. So he shared with us some of the experiences in his first deployment as a missionary overseas and gave us some insights about what he had in mind for his plans for this next deployment. And then we were able to uh, uh, visit with him and uh, took up a love offering for him. And so it was a very special morning. And as I said, we don't often get to visit face to face with missionaries. And so it was a real blessing. Okay, as we get back to our study about since this is the Christmas season and thinking about the Christmas story and the birth of Jesus, prior to that, there is the necessity of the birth and the ministry of the forerunner of the Messiah, which we understand to have been John the Baptist. And so a couple of weeks ago, or maybe three, we started a short study in the Gospels about John the Baptist, his conception, which was miraculous in itself, because his parents were past the age of childbearing. Uh, we saw about an, the angel Gabriel appearing to John the Baptist's dad, Zacharias, as he was fulfilling the duties of the priest and burning incense in the temple and told him of the coming birth of his son and that he would be named John and that he would be the one to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, according to the Old Testament prophecies. And so then we looked at uh, the conception and then a little bit of information about Gabriel appearing to Mary and then Mary mis visiting uh, Elizabeth. And then we saw about the birth of John the Baptist and how his dad was then also filled with the Holy Spirit. And we talked about that Mary and Jesus, Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, John the Baptist himself, and Zacharias, all were filled with the Holy Spirit, which happened prior to the day of Pentecost. So it was one of, or several of those exceptions to the fact that most of the time under the Old Covenant, which would be the Old Testament prior to the cross, the Holy Spirit did not indwell individual believers, but he would come upon them to empower them. Since the day of Pentecost, we understand that the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit comes to indwell with our spirits when we become believers and Christ followers. So today we're going to look at the beginning of John the Baptist ministry. We don't know anything about his childhood. We know that uh, he grew up and he was out in the desert. And so I'm going to begin reading in Matthew chapter 3, the first 12 verses. And I think I'll read all of the accounts in the gospel uh, records of John the Baptist's early ministry. And then we'll make a few comments at the end. So I'll begin in Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he 
who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. And we'll find that common to all of these gospel accounts of John the Baptist's early ministry. Verse 4 says, Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees <clears throat> coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham, even from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So now we'll turn to Mark's gospel and we'll find the parallel verses in Mark's account in chapter one of his gospel. Mark chapter one, verses one through eight. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in the prophets. Notice that we were in chapter three in Matthew because prior to that, there was a genealogy. There is no genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Remember, we've mentioned many times that Mark presents Jesus as a servant, and there's no need for knowing the genealogy of a servant. And so it starts right off in chapter 1 about uh, the birth of Jesus and so forth. So in verse 1, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the Prophets, and here he's going to quote from Malachi about this forerunner and also again from Isaiah chapter 40. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So now we'll move to Luke's gospel, and it will be in chapter 3 of Luke. And it follows a genealogy that we find in Luke that goes from Jesus all the way back to Abraham because Luke presented Jesus as the Son of Man. I'll begin reading in verse number 1 of Luke chapter 3. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness, and he went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. 
Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, the rough ways smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And there that quote from Isaiah chapter 40 went all the way from verse 3 through verse 5. So now we'll be at verse 7 of Luke chapter 3. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Wherefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham even from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is very similar to the parable that Jesus gave about the wheat and the tares. Verse 10. So the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. There's a question there about these soldiers. My opinion is they were Roman soldiers. We don't read about soldiers at this particular time in uh, the history of Israel. Verse 15, now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, Christ would be the Greek word or translation for Messiah. John answered saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Again, that analogy that's similar to the Lord's parable of the wheat and the tares at the end of the age when the angels as the reapers come and gather the tares and throw them into the fire to be burned but the good wheat representing the children of God are gathered into his barn which I believe is a reference to being ushered into the kingdom age verse 18 and with many other exhortations he preached to the people but Herod the tetrarch being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added to this, above all, that he shut up John in prison. So that's a little bit of information that leaps ahead of the context of our study for today. Now we'll move to John chapter 1, and I'll begin reading at verse number 6. And this is in the first chapter of John because there's no genealogy in John either. John presents Jesus, and John the Apostle presents Jesus as deity. And the closest thing that we have to a genealogy in his gospel account is in the first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And so that's as close as you get to a genealogy because deity, the eternal Godhead, has no genealogy. He was from eternity past to eternity future. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So this is referring to John the Baptist now. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light. And there in my translation, the New King James translation, light is capitalized, referring to or meaning that it is a reference to Jesus. So to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man. These next verses, 9 through 14, aren't going to be speaking specifically about John the Baptist, but they're going to be 
kind of a an interlude or a, a parenthetical inclusion here about Jesus, the light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's the new birth that we talk about when people say being born again, referencing a spiritual birth in contrast to our physical birth. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So now we'll come back to some verses that reference John the Baptist. I'll begin reading in John chapter 1, verse 15. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Remember that Mary and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, were relatives, which means that John the Baptist and Jesus also were relatives. Verse 16, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son. And here I believe that it would be good to remind us that when we read the word begotten and begotten Son, it's a reference to a future bringing him back from the dead, not that he is begotten as his first moment of creation was when he was born to Mary in Bethlehem. Because remember, he's the second person of the Trinity and has been ever since eternity past. So that's a little beyond our comprehension, but I think it's good to remind us that when it says that he's the only begotten son, it normally references the one that God raised from the dead the second person of the Trinity. So the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews, that's John the Baptist, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. And their prophet is also capitalized, referring to the Messiah. And I'm going to pause right now and go back to the book of Deuteronomy. And you can just stay there and listen if you want. I, if you want to turn, I'm going to read from Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verses 15 through 19. This was when Moses was giving the second uh, giving of the law to that second generation of Jews that had been in the wilderness and were about to cross the Jordan to go into the promised land. And he was giving them a second time the law of Moses. And he's having these words to say to them about God is going to one day out in the future, raise up another prophet like himself. And it's a reference to the Messiah, which we understand is a reference to Jesus which John the Baptist also understood, and that's why he said uh, that he was not that prophet. So from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 19, Moses speaking, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear, according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb. Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more lest I die. That was a reference to the people in the wilderness at the time when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the law, that when God came down upon the mountain, 
fire and smoke and thunder and all kinds of lightnings and things took place and the people were afraid. And so they didn't want to be close to that for fear that they would die. And so they wanted Moses to go on their behalf. Verse 17 says, And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. So this was Moses way back prior to the nation of Israel entering the promised land, speaking and prophesying that way out into the future, God would send his Messiah and God's word would then go through the Messiah to the people. And anyone that did not listen and heed the words of the Messiah, God would hold them accountable, which is exactly the case for these unbelieving religious leaders that then will show up on the scene after Jesus begins his earthly ministry. And we'll look at that next week when John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan. <clears throat> so these verses are the reasons that the people asked John the Baptist who he was. Was he Elijah? Because there had been a prophecy that Elijah would come before the Messiah. No, he wasn't, he said. Are you the Christ? No. Are you that prophet? Which is another way of saying, are you the Messiah? And he said, no. So in verse 22 of John chapter 1, then they said to him, Who are you then, that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What did you say about yourself? He said to them, and here he's going to quote again another time from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize? if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bath Abara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. So there is the account of the ministry of John the Baptist, the early ministry of his uh, time of ministry, when he was called by God out of the wilderness to come to the area of Judea around the Jordan River and begin to baptize people and to fulfill that prophecy that he would be the one to make straight the way of the Lord. So the last thing that we read about John the Baptist the last time we talked about him was from Luke chapter 1 and verse 80 that said, So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day his manifestation to Israel, which is what we read about today. So from last time to today, it's like leaping forward some 30 years from the time that he was a babe when his dad Zacharias prophesied about him until he comes now beginning his own ministry. So he came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and he told the people to repent because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. That's the very same message that Jesus preached when he was here in his earthly ministry. It's the very same message that he instructed his apostles to preach when he commissioned them to go out two by two. It's a different message than what Paul the Apostle and then the Apostles after the cross preached because then the gospel message changed to the kingdom of heaven is not at hand because Jesus had ascended and gone back to heaven. But the message then was, and still is today, that Jesus came, died on the cross, was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures so that his shed blood would give a satisfactory sacrificial payment for our sin debt. And now he has ascended back into heaven 
and one day will return to set up his earthly kingdom. That would be the gospel message that we hear today. So there's also some potential controversy over these statements that I read, where it says that John instructed the people, I baptize you with water for repentance. Or some of the translations may say, I baptize you with water unto repentance. And so the Greek word for to or unto is the word that we would pronounce ice. And it's a primary preposition in Greek. And it can mean into or because of. And so modern day commentaries, the ones that I'm familiar with, will normally translate or give a commentary on these verses where it says, John baptized with water to or unto repentance. They would say that the meaning is that he baptized them because they had repented, not in order to be baptized in order to receive repentance or salvation. In our dispensation of the church age, we understand that Paul and the rest of the Bible, for that matter, teach us that salvation is entirely by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, not of any kind or sort of works, but it is a gift from God, which then would exclude water baptism as being a prerequisite for salvation because that would serve as a work that we do. And remember when uh, Paul and uh, Silas were in the Philippian jail and at night they were having their worship service and their chains were loosed and the jailer thought that everyone had escaped and he was about ready to fall on his sword and commit suicide as a last attempt of some type of dignity. Paul called to him from inside the prison, said, do yourself no harm, we're all here. And he took a light and rushed into them and uh, probably fell down before them and said, what must I do to be saved? Paul didn't tell him you had to join the church and get baptized and start tithing and do all these other things. The simple answer to the very important question, what must I do to be saved, was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So salvation is a gift from God based upon his grace and our faith in Jesus Christ. So baptism was nothing new to the Jewish people in those days. Baptism was a ceremonial washing that took place many, many times in their ceremonies, in their feast, in their offering of sacrifices. It was also something that was very familiar to them for Gentiles in that when a Gentile wanted to be a Jewish proselyte and they would go through a kind of a uh, probationary period, at the end of that, they would be baptized in water signifying as an outward witness that they had given up their pagan idolatrous practices or their Gentile practices and were now fully committed to follow after Judaism. And that may be one reason why when we get to the time of the epistles in the Bible and Paul's ministry especially, and then that council in Jerusalem where Paul and Barnabas and Titus went to explain uh, the message that they had been preaching and teaching, there were people that thought that those new believers needed to be circumcised and follow after the Mosaic law. But Paul uh, stood his ground and there was an agreement made between the elders and the apostles at the Jerusalem church that it was not necessary for believers to follow after Judaism from that point going forward. So there are some people that will say, well, I believe that the way that this passage is worded, that it tells me that baptism is necessary for salvation. And if I come across people with that opinion or that interpretation, then I would say to them, Remember the four questions that we ask about every passage. What was said? Who said it? To whom was it said? And when was it said? And then those answers will give us 
an understanding of whether the passage that we're reading is instruction for us in our day, or if it is informational purposes that help us better understand the, the passages of Scripture for the Old Testament or for someone else, and maybe we could make application of them spiritually. And so if people adhere to the thought that John was baptizing these people and it was a requirement for their salvation, so to speak, that that would have been under the dispensation of the Old Covenant because it was prior to the cross, prior to the day of Pentecost. And now in our dispensation, the church age, we get the doctrine that we teach for the New Testament church from the epistles, especially the ones that Paul wrote. And again, he told that Philippian jailer, the only thing that was necessary for salvation was to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So then we have what we refer to as believer's baptism, which means after a person becomes a believer, then they are baptized in water as an outward sign of what has already taken place on the inside that is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. The only baptism that is necessary for salvation is what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And I'll read that. In fact, I'll read verses 13 and 14. For by one Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So here, the context of the baptism of the Holy Spirit here is not water baptism. It's that meaning of baptism to be totally identified with the body of Christ, totally immersed into the identity of Christ and the body of Christ. Very similar to the way Paul said that the Israelites were baptized unto Moses in the Red Sea. And remember that they didn't get wet when they went through the Red Sea. The Bible says they, because God parted the waters, they walked across on dry ground. So when Paul said that those Israelites were baptized into Moses in the Red Sea, it means they were totally identified with Moses as they went through the Red Sea on dry ground. So here we have John the Baptist and has begun his earthly ministry. Next week, we'll look at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry and when Jesus comes and John will introduce Jesus to the crowd as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and then baptizes Jesus. So if you'd like to read ahead, just read a little bit beyond the verses that we looked at today and you'll be ready for next week. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the blessings you've given. Thank you for your word and the way that you explain to us that we might understand the eternal plan of salvation that you have intended for us and for all of mankind, even from before the foundation of the world. Thank you for those who join us online. We ask for your continued blessings on them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hopefully see you Saturday afternoon in our study on the Holy Spirit. Until then, Lord bless you.